Coming up on What's the Hoops, we have highlights and reaction from the girls' state tournaments where Centerville, Vermilion, and O'Gorman were crowned state champions. Then we look ahead to the boys' state tournament with a preview of all the best players, matchups, and of course, our predictions. What's up, it's What's the Hoops with Darren Wallace, Jason, and Dara Jandy, if you're a friend of the show. And We've wrapped up the girls' season in South Dakota. What a season it was. We've got our three state champions. We weren't too far off on our predictions, yeah. but weren't great. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But what a season it was for the girls. Yeah. And, you know, the state championship teams feels like, you know, it was hard-earned and well-deserved. And just tremendous games. I mean, whether it was some of the championship games that turned out great, uh, a lot of the quarterfinal games were great, a lot of the semifinal games were great across the board. Uh, just fun to watch their seasons and uh, how it ended for Centerville, a team that you know didn't have girls basketball seven years ago and now are state champions. Vermilion in a loaded field to Class A and then O'Gorman to get a couple scares and still come out as champs. All right, let's start in Class B uh, where we had, uh, it, it was like you said, a loaded class, a couple of upsets and you know, of course my pick, I don't, did you pick T as well? Well, this is Class B. I took. Oh right, I, Class I believe B. You had Pardon Warner, me. if I remember I had, yes, right. Yes, yes, I did. I did yes, have Warner, and they didn't quite get back th past yeah. the first round. Yeah. I had Wall. They didn't get past the first round either. <laughs> yeah, it was tough to pick Class B, but uh, let's let's look at how they got there. So Arlington beat JVC fifty-one to forty-one. Ethan defeated Wall in the first round fifty-one to forty-five. Then Lyman got past previously unbeaten Harding. 54-49, so a couple of close games mm -hmm. there. And then Centerville, the eventual champion, they beat my pick for champion, Warner, 59-50 to in that first round. Then in the semis, Arlington won a bit of a low-scoring game, 44-41 yeah. over Ethan. And Centerville finished strong in that one, 52-45 to to get the seven-point win. And then, of course... That would set up the championship on Saturday night in Rapid City. Yeah, and so Centerville, Arlington, you know, two teams that have been top, near the top of the rankings most of the year, uh, but really not a powerful number one. But they both came in with a lot of um, firepower here toward the end of the year. Centerville ended up winning that game 62-44. They had the lead beginning to end. Arlington made a run in the second half, but didn't quite have enough to overtake Centerville. Centerville got great contributions from all across the court. They shot the ball well, and in the end, they played enough defense to hold a team that was tough to hold down in Arlington. And after the game, we have some commentary from their head coach, Tucker Tornberg. So congratulations, Centerville on the win like you said didn't even have a, a girls basketball program seven years ago Crazy. what a quick turnaround i mean it, it it takes a while especially in high school to get teams going but you know to do that in just seven years less than a decade that's some impressive and stuff. what i love now is tucker tornberger has kind of a mentoring system where you know the varsity girls mentor an elementary kid so that doesn't happen again they don't go a period without a team and uh, I think Centerville is going to be strong for a long time. Yeah, congratulations to Centerville. Let's move on to Class A. Like you said, the loaded this one was Class loaded. A, and this one was exciting. Um, I actually got to go to one of the games uh, amidst our busy uh, tournament schedule. That was great uh, to see the two future Jackrabbits going at it. But Class A was about as good as it gets. You know, you mentioned the load; it, it was loaded, and yeah, there was plenty of just good games. So uh, Sisseton uh, ended up defeating uh, eight seed Mount Vernon Plankinton, 57-47. Uh, but then Vermilion, they went back and forth with Mapia Luda, who I think both of us actually picked yeah. in that first round, and they actually won that game 41 to 37. So Vermilion with a big, uh, a big win uh, in that first round that would, you could argue eventually catapulted them to, to keep going on their run. Uh, Sioux Falls Christian won 53-42 over Hanson, and then T area. Got the upset over Flandreau, but again, we talked about it. T never really truly felt like a no. six seed. They were just in that rating because, you know, they, they had four losses, but none of them coming. And they played a lot of uh, double-A They played a lot schools. of double-A teams. It was tough. Um, but, yeah, again, up with the upset over Flandreau in a really good game. It started off a little bit slow. Uh, both, you know, both teams really couldn't. There was a point where it felt like there was a lid on the rim. Well, the I think rim was, was tight that game. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you what, there was there – was, Usually better shooting from these two teams, but we still saw some star power in the end. Yeah, I think the first the finals uh, the first quarter final score was five to two. But then once these two teams got going, it was a good one. T would eventually pull off the win, um, 
52 to 47. So I was feeling good after that. Yeah. That was my pick. My girl Katie Vasica was trying to make me look like a genius. Uh, she would do that in the second round as well. T came back from uh, down at halftime to win 48 to 44 in the semis. So I was feeling even better after that one. On the other side, Vermillion uh, outscored Sisseton. 14 to 8 in the fourth quarter to get the three point win. So, Vermillion, I mean, they were in a lot of battles and they kept overcoming yeah. and pulling it out every single time. And Vermillion, you know, with their eighth grade, Taylor Rovers had an excellent game, especially in that fourth quarter. And it's so f fun, interesting to see, you know, a team hand their team over to an eighth grader or just let her, let her go. And, but she, she did it time and time again in this tournament, especially in those semifinals. Absolutely. The future was definitely bright for her. And then we got to the championship game between Vermillion and T. And it looked like uh, T would, would handle this one. Yeah. They were up for most of the game. But once again, in that fourth quarter, Vermillion making a run end up getting the win and I mean congratulations to Vermillion what a performance by them what a run to go on you know every time it seemed like they were down in the fourth yeah. quarter they would just get that run they would hit those big buckets really impressive stuff for yeah them. this time they were down six going into that that fourth quarter um, they ended up taking a lead with uh, Casey Hansen hitting a three-pointer with about three minutes left and Casey Hansen was coming back from an injury didn't get to play full time until just the last couple of games of the regular season. But what a boost she gave the team. You know, they basically placed six players on that team, and to have Casey Hansen back was huge for them. So they came back, had that strong fourth quarter again. Chandler Cleveland led the way with 20 points in that game, and Vermillion gets their second state title. And after the game, uh, actually Monday, I got a chance to talk to their head coach, John Brooks, about what that meant to the, their team and the community. You beat an undefeated team, the number one seed, and possibly the best player in the state. I mean, it was not an easy road, right? Yeah, you know, we uh, we kind of talked about that um, at our with the coaches and the girls afterwards. Is you know, we really thought going to the state tournament and any team there had a chance to win. I think all eight teams, if anybody would have won it, nobody would have been surprised. It was it was a packed field, and uh, to have to beat the teams that we had to beat to get it done. Um, to be the last one standing to, was uh, it just says a lot about our girls. So once again, congratulations to Vermillion. Also, congratulations to all the other teams who didn't win the championships on such great seasons. It was a really fun season. Uh, and, of course, you know, like we mentioned, uh, Katie tried to lead me to victory, tried to lead, <laughs> uh, make me look like a smart guy. Uh, just came up a little bit short, but it was a really impressive season, and I'm sure we'll be seeing plenty more Katie Vasica in the next yes. few years. I mean, here's what Vermillion did. They beat an undefeated team in the quarterfinals in Makpia Luta, and then they – Beat the number one team in the field in Sisseton with a comeback win. And then they beat the number one player in the state in Katie Vasica. You can't do much more than what Vermillion did. But if you played this tournament over several times, so many good teams. I mean, it could have gone, gone a million it, literally, ways. Literally, there's probably a scenario where each team yeah, wins there really is. in some sort of alternate universe. But the Tanagers so, did it. Yeah, they did it. And congratulations to them. Let's move on to class two-way, which was, a, there were some shocking results, and uh, if you remember I said, you know, uh, Rap C uh, Rapid City Stevens, in that first round matchup, it might be an 8-1, could end up being closer than yeah. we think, and that's what ended up happening, so let's go through double uh, A. So, uh, Rapid City Stevens, they were down by 20 points in the third quarter, they roared back, and they forced overtime, O'Gorman probably thought they would have had an easy one, but they didn't get it, they did end up winning the game, but Stevens gave, uh, yeah. gave O'Gorman a scare in that first And round. Talia Porter, the leading scorer in this entire tournament, was fouled out during part of that comeback. So what Stevens did, only one senior on that squad, by the way. They'll, they'll be back next year. Yeah, they will certainly be back. I mean, to do that as an eight seed this year, you'd like to think that next year they'll be even better. And they definitely won't be an eight seed and definitely won't be a surprise be a whatever they do mm -hmm. in the postseason. But like I said, O'Gorman survived. They won 64 to 58 and they escape and move on to the semis. Sioux Falls Jefferson, they avenged that loss to Pierre. They won 45 to 41 in the first round to set up a date with O'Gorman in the semifinals. On the other side of the bracket, Harrisburg, they avenged the loss to Mitchell, winning 57 to 41. They won pretty comfortably. And then Brandon Valley, they won 58 to 42 over Spearfish, who, like you said, came into the tournament with a lot of momentum. But Brandon Valley did what they needed to do, took care of business, moved on to the semifinals. But then, excuse me, in the semifinals, it was a duel, uh, but Lucy Moore and Molly Abdouche got the job done. They advanced 
pass who falls Jefferson, who, like you said, you were talking about teams who will only have, you know, obviously uh, Jaden Dunn will be graduating, but they've got a bright future in, in Jefferson. They won't be going anywhere. So, uh, you know, look out for Jefferson in the future. But O'Gorman does, you know, does the job. They move on to the championship. But then on the other side, Brandon Valley beats Harrisburg with some really great defense, and they got 23 points from Olivia Padgett. And, uh, yeah, Brandon Valley, I mean, after – Beating a team with the momentum that Spearfish had coming into it, they probably felt really good about their chances, and they did. They proved that they played, in the semifinals. They played so well in the quarters and the semis, and Olivia Padgett looked like a star, and she's just a sophomore. Ava Kellenberger, another sophomore, had a great tournament for them. Uh, again, another team with, with two important seniors on that team, but they have a really bright future, and they punched their ticket into the championship game on Saturday night. Yeah, and in that championship game, it was a team everyone expected. O'Gorman taking care of business. It was a good game all the way throughout, but O'Gorman just so much talent, so much depth, uh, great leadership as well. Uh, so of all the picks that we made, we did get one. Yeah, we it felt one. like the easy one, but it certainly wasn't easy to get there. But O'Gorman ends up taking care of business and doing what everyone thought they would. Well, Brandon Valley, as you said, came out hot in that game. They led 11-10 excuse me, after the first quarter, and they were down just one point at halftime. And even into the third quarter, they regained a lead, a two-point lead. And I went into the huddle at Brandon Valley, and they were fired up being up going into the fourth quarter. But there is a different gear that O'Gorman has that not anybody else has. And in the fourth quarter, Sidney Terveen, their young player, scored nine points in the fourth quarter. Molly Abdouche had six points in the fourth quarter. And they turned up the defense, shut down Brandon Valley, and took home the title. Not only a title, but an undefeated title for Kent Colesrud and Mali Abdouche and Lily Moore, and we talked to all three of them after the game. I feeling awesome. I mean, it's surreal to be able to do this with my teammates for the second time in my career. It's just such a pleasure, and I'm so happy we could do it again. Um, it just feels great. Uh, obviously, the emotions are kind of everywhere through this tournament. We've kind of gone through a couple tougher games than we did the regular season, but we fought our way through. We had confidence in each other, and it's just surreal. Like I'm, I'm so proud of our team and the girls who worked hard and took on their role and did it, did it perfectly. Uh, I mean, we're, I'm just tremendously proud of this team. It's a great group. Uh, proud of the 2020 team, you know, to go 21 and all as well. Just so unfortunate, uh, those kids weren't able to play it out. But um, you know, we did. I've just been very fortunate, very blessed to have really, really good basketball players in our program. I got great assistant coaches, and I just try. I just try to do my job the best I can, and um, just really blessed to be out with Gorman and coach the girls basketball, and uh, fortunate to coach this group and win a state championship. So once again, congratulations to O'Gorman on the win. Congratulations to all the teams on a great season, another great South Dakota girls basketball season in the books. Can't wait to see it again next year. But with that, let's talk about the boys. And um, it was a long time coming to get here. Another really exciting season. A lot of unpredictability, but nonetheless, we've arrived at the final eight in class double A, single A, and B. And we'll start there in class B, which was a wild ride to begin yeah. with. I mean, it seemed every week we had a new top five, we had a new number one. That's yeah, true. And again, this class could go any which way, but alas, this is what we've landed on. So the one seed, White River, will be taking on the eight seed, Viberg Hurley. The four seed, Westington Springs, will be taking on the fifth seed, Howard. Uh, the two seed, DeSmet, will be taking on the seven seed, Gregory. And the three seed, Castlewood, will take on the six seed, Leola Frederick area. Class B had four different teams at number one in the polls this year. And that just lets you know, yeah, yeah. this this is going to be a wild ride. There's a ton of teams who are all capable of beating each other. That's what they did all season long. Yeah. It seems like they just took turns beating up on each other. But uh, if you're not familiar with some of the top scores in that class, there's a lot of talent in this class as well, which probably is why everybody beats each other. But, Jandy, who were some of the well, top players in this? In you got to you gotta love the way Nick Marshall stepped up for White River this year. In the absence of, of Joe Seiler, he is, really took that scoring load, and he actually is the leading scorer in this tournament with twenty over 26 points per game. Uh, Nick Hansen, you know, came up and had a great year. Still an underclassman, still getting over 20 points a game. A lot of good players. Uh, Brian Lowey in the middle, one of the biggest – guys that you're going to see in this tournament playing in the middle for Castlewood. And then there's there's guys like Howard. Howard's a team that has really come through with the leadership of Luke Kepsel and Colt Kepsel, two guys 
that still have another year left. Just big guys. They start from the inside and play out with those two big guys. So, ton of talent. And uh, check out the blogs to make sure you can see all the top players and all the uh, top scorers in this tournament. But uh, that's just a, a little taste of what you're going to see in the Bees. All right. Of course, all the action going down at the Barnett Center at Northern State. Let's take a little bit of a deeper dive into these matchups. We'll start with White River, the one seed versus the eight seed Viberg Hurley. White River qualified for their 19th straight state tournament. So this is an area. 19, yeah, folks. This, this is a, a spot in the year where they're very familiar with playing. They haven't played Viberg Hurley yet this year, though. And two of the best players in this tournament yeah. We'll see their season cut a little bit short. Yeah, so Nick Marshall we talked about, Nick Hansen. I mean, basically, those are the two of the guys playing for the uh, Player of the Year in Class B this year. Uh, but for Viberg Hurley, their depth is better than most teams. Um, they know that they're going to have to go against a tough White River team that likes to run people out, but they have enough people to keep up with that. Uh, it's going to be really interesting to see these two teams try to shut down each other's top scorer. And I think... Viberg Hurley also is a little bit more healthier than they have been at parts of the year. So with the depth, with the star power, they definitely have a chance. This is not your typical 1-8. This is one of those games that could go either way. For White River, they've been solid on both sides of the ball all season long, and they've gotten a huge boost from Jordan Euler. He's a guy who came over from St. Thomas Moore, and he's putting double-digit you know, rebounds some games and points almost every game into that front court, which really balances out Nick Marshall. So uh, White River earned that one seed, even though you know they come in with, with a, a couple losses on the year. Uh, they're definitely going to be a tough team to knock out. But Viber Hurley was a number one team earlier this year, too, remember? And now they're healthy. So this one, this one's definitely going to be one to watch. Yeah. Like they say, though, in the postseason, guards rule. When you got a guy like Nick Marshall, it's yeah. pretty easy, or rather, it's easier to lean that way. But like you said, also not a typical 1A matchup. These are two really, really good teams. Then moving on to the 4 5 matchup on the same side of the bracket, Westington Springs, the four seed, taking on Howard, the five seed. These are two of the hottest teams in Class B. Yeah. They'll take it. They'll meet each other at 145. Westington Springs quietly had just a one-loss season, and that loss was to the team that they'll be playing, Howard, back in December. Since then, they've gone 21-0. Yeah. Howard has won 13 in a row two hot leading teams. into this part of the season. How do you see this one shaking out? You know what? Westington Springs, they have won 21 in a row. Their first game of the year, they lost to Howard. A low-scoring game, but they haven't seen a team quite like Howard in a long time. Their defense has really been the key to their success this year. That was the challenge from Coach Heater this year. How do we really improve that defensive side because we know we can score the ball and they have done that in a big way. Uh, they think the game will be very similar to the first time. A low scoring game, two really good defenses, uh, two teams that have some explosive scorers, but but it's going to come in small bunches, I think, in this game. Um, for for uh, the opponents, Howard, they're a team that loves to play, like we said, inside out. They've got the Kepsels, the big dudes on the in the middle who are both you know, 15 to 20 point game scorers in a game. But then when they get guarded too often, they pop it back out to the perimeter. They hit a few shots. That's how they their path to win this game. This is going to be a terrific 4-5 matchup. Yeah, should be about as good as advertised. When you get 4-5 and five together, yep. it's usually a good one. This one will certainly not disappoint. Let's go to the other side of the bracket. Number two, DeSmet versus number seven, Gregory. DeSmet's won three titles in a row. Of course, yeah. they were led by guys who ended up going to play Division I basketball. Right. Can they make it four in a row? We will have to see, but they'll have to stop Daniel Mitchell and, Gre and the Gregory Gorillas if they want to do that. And DeSmet, one of those teams who was kind of in that carousel for the number one seed in, the, in Class B this year. At one point, they were up, yeah. up that high. But again, Gregory... No slouch, no slouch as well. Yeah, Dismet has really challenged themselves this year, like they always do. One of the toughest schedules in all of Class B. But Gregory's playing good ball right now, and their star, Daniel Mitchell, you know, he's had some huge scoring years. He's now a senior, but, you know, as a sophomore, even as a freshman, he was putting up gobs of points. Now he's, he's more of a well-rounded player. He shares the ball. There's a ton of guys that get points on this team. He sees a lot of, of junk defenses, uh, but finds a way to get her done. But Dismet... They've got guys on this team who have been sitting on the bench waiting for their turn over those last three years. A lot of them got playing time, and now it's their turn to see if they can step up a notch and, and carry that Bulldog tradition on for one more year. It's going to be really tough, but they definitely have a path to be able to make that happen.
All right, so yeah, two seven again. None of these matchups. It feels like seed doesn't matter. It doesn't. In class B this year. Mm -hmm. So throw them out. Yeah, excited to see how that one shakes out. Just met, of course, again going for four championships in a row. Then to round out this section, number three Castlewood against number six Leola Frederick. A lot of people believe it's Castlewood's, Castlewood's turn to go and win this whole thing, but Leola Frederick. They've had just one loss to, uh, this season to Falkton, and they've won 10 in a row coming into the tournament. Castlewood's one of those teams that we were really high on earlier this year, especially on our show, yeah. talking about them and what they've been able to do. But Leola Frederick, I feel like we didn't talk about too much, no. but they're coming in um, – with they said they set a school record with 22 wins this yeah. season. So again, Leola Frederick no slouch as well. Interesting dynamic in this game because you've got Brian Lowey, the the toughest big man in the state for for Castlewood, the junior who's going to plug up the middle, and then you've got Leola Frederick who wants to get up and down the court as much as possible. They'll rotate 10 guys, which you almost never see in Class B basketball, where you have 10 guys you can just come in and and turn the heat up. So that's going to be a lot of fun to see how those two different styles clash. Uh, Coach Paul Rosh of Castlewood says they're just going to approach this like they do any other game. They know they're probably the favorites here, but they got to get past the tough Leola Frederick team. And uh, that's going to be interesting. When it tips off, you know that both teams are going to lay it all on the line. Head coach Brock Passion of Leola Frederick said, you know what, we're going to come into this game and uh, we're not going to be happy if we lay an egg. We know we're not the favorites here, but we know we can play with these guys. And just like we said about Class B, all these games are going to be tremendously competitive, I think, for first-round games in Aberdeen. All right. Well, Jandy, time to make some predictions. Right, let's go. And I know we, we didn't do too, too great with the girls. Probably won't do much better with the boys, <laughs> but we're certainly going to try. Yeah. So, 1A, White River, Viberg Hurley. Personally, I'm going to ride the Nick Marshall wave, and I'm going to pick White River over Viberg Hurley. Then in the 4-5 matchup, too close to call, but I think Wessington maybe get a little bit of revenge for I mean, they gave them their only loss of the season. Wouldn't it be right in the postseason to get your look back and also get a step closer to a state championship? So I'm going to pick Wessington Springs in that one. So a little chalky to start, but I'm going to stay chalk as well. And we go to the 2-7. I think to Smat, like you said, one of the toughest schedules in Class B. And we always talked about them going up against those good teams. And, I mean, they only had three losses on the year. So they were pretty successful against those really quality teams. So I'm going to ride with the Smet in that one. And then... Yolo Frederick and uh, Castlewood kind of staying chalky again. I think Castlewood, a lot of people think it's their turn. I would tend to agree. You know, just looking at their results, looking at, the, looking at their uh, personnel, I'm going to lean Castlewood in that one. But now it gets dicey because those really good, those good teams that I talked about, they all match up with each other. And I picked no upsets, so surely I'm not going to get all those right. <laughs> but uh, White River against Westington Springs. Again, White River is one of those teams who they, they actually got to the top of the polls in that carousel that we talked about. And I actually re I, I really think that with, you know, in the postseason, you need guards that can create. And Nick Marshall's one of those guys. I mean, averaging 26 points per game in a 32-minute in a basketball game, that just goes to show you how uh, prolific of a scorer he is. Um, and I'm going to, again, ride that wave. I think White River continues to advance. They ride uh, the hot hand of Nick Marshall, who's been carrying them all season long. Then you go to DeSmet and Castlewood, and I think this is where this is the only upset maybe I'll pick uh, in this section where I think Castlewood will get the job done over DeSmet. We've talked about their personnel, uh, and DeSmet, like we said, has they are battle-tested, so it's not a matter of them not being able to ride in the moment. I just feel like Castlewood... Um, with some of the results they've had this season. And you can go either way between these teams. Yeah. Like you said, there's, you can make a, a 10 different alternate universes <laughs> where each team in this section could win this whole thing. But I'm going to ride with Castlewood. And then in the championship, I'm going to pick uh, White River over Castlewood because I think just when you have a guard, you know, uh, Castlewood, they do, like you said, they play inside out. And I think tending to rely on that inside play, it's a little bit tougher in the postseason. I think you can come up with some, uh, like you like to say, junk defenses. I think you can actually, for, you know, come up with some that make it tough to get it to your big guys inside. Whereas when you have a guard that can create and kind of, you know, get the ball in the hands of the perimeter and work their way inside and playing that way, I think it's a little easier to get some good stuff happening. So I'm going to go with White River to win this whole entire section. I don't feel good about it because I think all these teams are so good and so talented. But if you had to, you know, if, you, if you're forcing me to make a pick, White River is where we I'm are going. forcing you to make a pick. So, <laughs> so you know, you got White River going all the way. I've got White River getting upset in the first round. This is how this could go. I could see both scenarios, but I do think that Viberg Hurley is 
playing a little better right now, playing more like they did at the Hanson Classic when they you know, played some of their best ball this year. Uh, I think this is a team that, that really has all the pieces to take apart a team like White River, but obviously could go either way. I like Howard as well, so I'm going to go against you again in that first round. I just think Howard's played a little tougher schedule coming into this game than Westington Springs, but again, I could see that one going both ways. I like DeSmit. I agree with Castlewood. I think those two teams um, really have felt like state title type contenders all season long. And when Castlewood plays DeSmit in the semis, or as I'm predicting, um, that'll be the second time they've played each other this year. The first time, Castlewood won on the road in DeSmet. I think it'll be a similar scenario this time. That's a tough matchup for DeSmit. Uh, they've got some good scorers with George Jensen's had a great year. Caden Fast has had a great year. Uh, Tom Onbaugh, a lot of the guys, uh, but they just don't have a great matchup for Brian Lowey, and I think that's going to be their downfall. And then on the top part of the bracket, I think Viber Curley gets it done again. I, I'm going to take Nick Hansen. I think he's going to really have a tremendous run here in the state tournament. And so give me Viber Curley and Castlewood on Saturday night, and I'm going to take Castlewood to get the championship. I think uh, I think they've been you know, up and down once in a while this year, but they've had a really tough schedule. They did lose to Viber Curley in the regular season, and I think they get revenge on Saturday night. All right, well, there it is. Castlewood for you, White River for me. Let's see if we can do a little bit better. We, okay. our, our, our brackets are kind of very opposite, so uh, only Somebody's one, gonna do someone's well. going to do well, but the or other we'll one's going to eat maybe, crow. Who knows? So... Let's move on to Class A. All right, let's do Class, Class A. A is, uh, you know, there's some really good teams. Not as much uh, of a carousel as far as, you know, you know the, the polls this season. Felt a little more steady. Um, and I think this could end up looking like maybe like the girls double uh, A class where it feels like there's a, a, a presumed favorite um, and everyone else is kind of playing catch up. But, of course, even, you know, O'Gorman on the girls side, they had some scares and no team in this section is without the possibility of being upset. So let's just take a look at who we've got matching up. Number one, Sioux Falls Christian will be matched up with number eight, Vermilion, in the first round. Number four, Pine Ridge against number five, Dakota Valley in the first round. Hamlin against Groton Area, that's the two in the seven in the first round. And then number three, Sioux Valley against number six, Rapid City Christian. So um, unlike Class B, yeah, Sioux Falls has been the number one yeah. team in the poll Literally, all season long, all from season. the beginning till the end. Uh, and while they are the favorites, there's a couple of other good teams. But uh, tell us about some of those players to watch because there's a few really talented kids that aren't just all on Sioux Falls Christian. I, I really think the top end talent in Class A is as good as anybody in the state, and it starts with the way Jackson Winger just played this year. Dakota Valley coming in two-time champs. Uh, Winger's been a starter for those two years, and now this season has gone up to 26 points per game. Great shooter from the outside. And then you've got Marvin Richard, another dude who is just a sophomore, averaging 23 points per game. He has been unbelievable this year. And then maybe some guys you don't hear as much about. Lane Teets from Groton area. He's had some tremendous games this year. He got a game ball from me this year. He could have had about three game balls with as many great games as he had. But And then you got some tremendous bigs in Griffin Goodberry, who's probably a Division I type of player, and Alex Squires, another Division I type of player on the inside. A couple 6'10 dudes who can really get it done. So a lot of fun to watch some of the top-end talent in Class A. Yeah, can't wait to see it all unfold. Let's dive a little deeper into the matchup, starting at the top with Sioux Falls, Christian, and Vermillion, the one versus eight game. Uh, the Chargers might be the best team, regardless of class. Uh, you know, a lot of coaches told me that. To, yeah, and, you know, and, and again, they're also young. People don't forget that they are young. They have no seniors, no seniors on that <laughs> no team. Seniors. So whatever you're seeing now, probably going to see it again next year. Uh, and Vermillion made it back to the state tournament, even though they had seven losses this year. So tell us a little bit about this match. Vermillion really came back strong in these last couple weeks into the playoffs, beat teams like Lennox, got some close wins. Uh, but this is the first time they've been back since 2021 when they broke their 35-year streak of not making it to a state tournament. So congratulations. Didn't take as long a second time for Vermillion to get there. Uh, but Mike Scouten, head coach for Sioux Falls Christian, he is instilling into these kids that – just because you were wire to wire, just because you've won every game, had a lot of comfortable wins, anything can happen. You're playing state tournament teams for three days in a row. Uh, they're going to have to just forget about the results of what happened in the regular season against Vermillion and start from ground zero. I think that makes them dangerous, though, 
because they will be grounded for this tournament. Uh, for Vermillion, you know, they really feel like they're going to play much better this time around. They know Sioux Falls Christian well. They play in the same conference, play every regular season, and they feel like this challenge is one that, that they have accepted. So we'll see. Vermillion has definitely improved, uh, but Sioux Falls Christian definitely the favorites here. Yeah, Sioux Falls Christian, they're, 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 they're sending a message. You know, what happened earlier, that's going out the window, yeah, and that could, be, that could make them even more dangerous than they already are. Now let's move on to the four and the five seeds. Pine Ridge and Dakota Valley should be a really good matchup. These two teams want to play fast, and they have two Player of the Year candidates with Marvin Richard on one side, Jackson Winger on the other side. Where do you lean in this one? Because, I mean, again, it could go either way. Yeah, Dakota Valley, you know, had a couple slip-ups this year. They haven't had slip-ups literally for the last two seasons. And this year, you know, a couple of mistakes. But Luke Bruns has really gotten better from his sophomore year to his junior year. Um, especially in the second half of the season, Luke Bruns has really been uh, good. But they don't, they don't have as many big guards to guard opposing guards. That's the one issue Dakota Valley's had this year. They do have Jackson Winger in the middle, um, a weapon that not a lot of other teams have. They've got a good matchup here with Pine Ridge, who really plays with some studs on the inside. Kanye Hollowhorn has had a way better year than any of us expected as a senior. And then, of course, Marvin Richard is a star, and it'll be so fun to watch him at the state tournament because not a lot of people know about Marvin Richard, and uh, this guy's a, a walking bucket. So make sure you check out this game. This this could go a million different ways. Yeah, and who doesn't like seeing up-tempo teams, fast-paced no. offenses? Should be a higher-scoring game. I know it might... You know, postseason time. Always good team too, but they usually, yeah. I think you're right. I think offense wins in this one. Yeah, and po in the postseason, shots get a little tighter. The moment gets a little big, but I think these are two teams that play so fast. You'll see a lot of scoring uh, either way. Now, on the other side of the bracket, Sioux Valley and Rapid City Christian. This is the first ever trip to the State A tournament for Rapid City Christian, uh, and they'll play a very seasoned tournament team in Sioux Valley. Uh, these teams did play back in the Hanson Classic, and Sioux Valley won. So. Were you expecting the same thing or maybe a little bit of vengeance in this matchup? It's, there might be a few differences here. Again, Sioux, uh, Rapid City Christian, a tremendous schedule. They had huge wins most of the year, but when they had tough games like Sioux Valley, they didn't come through. But remember, during that Hanson Classic game, they were without one of their starters and one of their guys off the bench. So they're, they're full this time. I think this is going to be a huge challenge for Sioux Valley. But, of course, when you play Sioux Valley, you got to stop a 6'10 dude and Alex Squires. And that's going to be the tough part for any team. They've got a very balanced attack, though, with Squires. So if they do find a way to stop Squires, they, they've got you know seven guys that they feel very comfortable with. And, you know Even off the bench, Bowden Schiller is probably one of the best athletes in this class. He's going to play D1 football at SDSU, and he comes off the bench for Sioux Valley. So I, I really like Sioux Valley in this one, but this Rapid City Christian team is better than a lot of people think. Yeah, Rapid City Christian is, is better than most people think, but I think that, man, that balance attack from Sioux Valley led by Alex Squires, it's, yeah. it's tough to match up with. Uh, then to round things out, <clears throat> excuse me, number two, Hamlin, and number seven, Groton Area. These two uh, started the season playing each other. Hamlin won 58-36, so pretty handedly they won. Uh, but Hamlin's only losses came to Sioux Falls Christian twice, and a team from Tennessee, Cordova, yeah. and all of Groton's losses came to state tournament teams, Hamlin, Pine Ridge, Dakota Valley, and Vermillion. So both teams are battle-tested. Both teams have played really good teams all season long. So how do you see this one shaking out? Because it's not like, you know, I think you kind of throw that first matchup out the window because now these two teams are in, in much different spots than they were then. I agree. This Groton area team, they've played that tough schedule, but they haven't gotten that big win against this, one of those state tournament teams. And they've got one of the best players in this class in Lane Teets, that's for sure. But it's going to take more than a one-person effort to get this thing done. It's going to be a tough matchup because I think, I think this Hamlin team is really good. And I, I, I love what Todd Neuendorf has done with these guys. Um, you know, they haven't had uh, um, Van Meteren. They haven't had Van Meteren all season long. But if uh, they play around, you know, Tyson Stevenson and Easton Neuendorf on the outside – they can kick it inside. They got a lot of guys they can bring in. I, I really like Hamlin. I, I think uh, this is going to be a tough matchup for Groton. Yeah, the Chargers, one of those teams where it feels like, you know, for as good as Sioux Falls Christian is, that's one team that could certainly give them a scare in this section. So time to make some predictions. You ready? All right. Let's do it. So um, I'll kick it off. Sioux Falls Christian Vermillion, like we said, 
Sioux Falls Christian is, is throwing the regular season away, and they're focused, they're ready. I think they take care of business and, and, and beat Vermillion pretty handily. I think they'll move on in that game. Then you got Pine Ridge and Dakota Valley. I'm riding with Dakota Valley in that one. I really think that, uh, you know, just the mismatch they have in terms of the size and the way that they play uh, so up-tempo. And, and to be able to play fast and play inside out, makes you a little bit more versatile as opposed to some teams who like to play fast but really rely more on the outside shooting. That's kind of what Pine Ridge feels like to me. So I'm going to ride with Dakota Valley in that matchup. Then the Chargers in Groton area. Hamlin, one of those teams that we, you and I have both liked all season long, and I'm going to ride with them in that first round. I'm going to take Hamlin to advance to the semifinals. And then Sioux Valley and Rapid City Christian, <clears throat> no revenge for Rapid City Christian, unfortunately. I think Sioux Valley, led by the big man Alex Squires on the inside, I think they – move on to the semifinals. Then going back up top, Sioux Falls Christian and Dakota Valley. Going to be closer than I think people will think. I think, I think so many people think that Sioux Falls Christian, they're just so much better. They're, I think they're, again, the best team regardless of class, but I think that there are, they can get caught. They're not without being able to be beaten. They've had a few games come down to the wire. I think this one will be a close one also when you consider just that it's the postseason and games will get a little bit tighter. And they know each other. They have right. played each other every year. Right. And I do think Sioux Falls Christian gets the win, but I do think it's a close one. I don't think either team wins by more than seven or eight points. I think this one is very close one or two possession game. Then on the other side, Hamlin and Sioux Valley. For as much as I do like Sioux Valley, I think Hamlin's just one of those teams where it just feels like this is their year to do something uh, and, and, and to make that run in the postseason. I'm going to pick Hamlin in this one over Sioux Valley, uh, and I feel pretty good about that. I think Hamlin's just been really, really well-rounded, really battle-tested, too. they played a lot of good teams, so Hamlin gets the job done in the semifinals. Then, going to go for a little bit of, of a surprise here. I think Hamlin gets the upset. I think that for as much as we talk about Sioux Falls Christian being the best team in the in the state, regardless of class, I think Hamlin is not too far off yeah, from being a candidate right. for that title. Um, and I also think Sioux Falls, Sioux Falls Christian, um, I, I think just listen, hear me out on this narrative here. <laughs> they don't have any seniors now. They have an undefeated season. They get to the championship. Maybe they falter this time around. Then I think it's theirs to lose next year when they have you know, some seniors who want to ride out into the sunset. But I think Hamlin right now, um, it might sound goofy narrative-wise, but I think Hamlin's also just a really good team. Yeah. And if anyone's capable of being the first team to give Sioux Falls Christian a loss this year, it's definitely the Chargers. So I am picking Hamlin. I'm not totally against almost everything you said there. Uh, but I'm going to agree. Sioux Falls Christian gets it done in the quarters. I think Dakota Valley gets it done in the quarters. I think Hamlin, and I also think Sioux Valley. I, I, although I do think Rapid City Christian, if they win, wouldn't shock me one bit. But I'm going to go with the, uh, the well, not the chalk because uh, Pine Ridge gets the loss. But other than that, all the favorites move on to the semifinals. And Sioux Falls Christian uh, against Dakota Valley, they handled them in the regular season. I think, I think they handle them again, to be honest with you. And then Hamlin takes on Sioux Valley. That's going to be an epic matchup. But I think Hamlin, again, just is too good. I remember watching them, what was it, one or two years ago in the Throwback Classic, and they were so young and played so many of these guys that are still playing. And uh, Nate Malchow, my analyst, said, hey, watch out. These guys are going to win a title before they're done. And, and that's why I kind of like what you said about what Hamlin does. But, so I agree. Sioux Falls Christian and Hamlin are playing on Saturday night. But I do think Sioux Falls Christian – will edge them out. The first time they played, they've played twice this year already. It'd be weird to have three matchups between the two best teams, but they played down to the last basket the first time. The second time was a little more comfortable, and I think that's a trend. I think Sioux Falls Christian has a way where they can handle some of the, that pressure from Hamlin, and they'll get it done once again. All right, so there you have it. The Class A predictions are in. We're pretty aligned. Pretty close. But, uh, yeah, like we said, it could go either way way uh, or really any any which way uh, in this section uh, even though it is led by one of the best teams in the state arguably the best team in the state I think they have some stiff competition that they could face now let's move on to class double a which is a bit of a, again that this one uh, alternate universes yeah. where it could go any which way it doesn't truly feel like there's just one team that stands above the rest these teams have all been playing each other all season long beating each other all season long so who knows which way it could go. But here's how the matchups shake out. Number one, Mitchell will take on number eight, Sioux Falls Jefferson in the first round. Number four, Sioux Falls Roosevelt will take on number five, Sioux Falls Washington in the first round. Then on the other side of the bracket, number two, Harrisburg will take on number seven, Watertown. And then on the bottom, number three, Brandon Valley will take on number six, Huron. And 
unlike the rest of these uh, classifications, only one 20 win team. Right. In this section, and, and a lot of the, like I said, a lot of these teams have been playing each other all year and beating each other. So, uh, man, no one's really been as consistent as Mitchell. They're the the, the lone 20 win team yeah. in this section at 20 and one. But everyone says that this tournament's wide open. I think you and I have kind of portrayed that as the season's gone on. But who are some of these players to look out for in this section? Well, that's one thing. Literally, some of these people watch state tournaments just to see who are the best players in the state. Who to watch? And I think you need to watch Blake Elwine, just a, a sophomore. He's like a six, uh, seven, six, eight guard for Huron, and he leads the state in scoring as a sophomore. So he's one of these guys that you want to, you know, keep tabs on. This guy might be going places. Colton Smith, another sophomore for Mitchell, who has been tremendous. He was our dunk champion, but he's also the top scorer for Mitchell. And then he joined up with the junior Marcus Talley. They're fantastic to watch together. Both can sky, get up and dunk, get up and down the court. Those are three guys you definitely want to watch. And then Harrisburg has a couple of studs too. Jacoby Merriman uh, going on to play at USF next year. He's a, an electric scorer, but uh, Braden Van Bakkeren has been just as good or better as kind of the, the Robin to his Batman this year. And in some games, you know, Van Bakkeren has taken over games. So I, I really like those two guys to watch for Harrisburg. And then all year we've talked about one of our favorites, Tommy Hoffman. Uh, the junior has been outstanding for Washington. I think he's one of those guys that can take over a game at any time. So I'm looking for those guys. And then Josh Altoff in the middle for Brandon Valley, probably the best big man in this tournament. And uh, sometimes, sometimes when you have the big man and the other guys don't, you know, that can be a huge key. So watch out for Brandon Valley too. All right, let's dive deeper into these matchups and look at how things could shake out in that first round and beyond, starting with number one, Mitchell, and number eight, Jefferson. The Colonels come in as the top dogs, and this is their best regular season since 1985. Yeah. Mitchell and Jefferson did play each other back in January 30th, <clears throat> excuse me, and they, they handled the Cavs. Uh, since then, Jefferson's gone 6-0 and against 2A competition, so maybe a different type of Jefferson team that we could be seeing in this first round. Yeah, I love Jefferson and the way they're playing, especially down the stretch. I mean, remember they started the year as the the number one team in the polls just because kind of what they did last year, but they have really made a trek. They started the season, they had a lot of growing up to do, and they really have grown up, and now they're, they're kind of a veteran team. On the other side, you've got Mitchell. Uh, you know, Riker Kreutzfeldt's <clears throat> done a great job with a really a young group. Suk, Suk up the senior uh, Tally, the junior, and Colton Smith, the sophomore, have been fantastic. The best threesome of anybody in this state. Uh, but they imagine that Jefferson is going to come out and try to wear them down throughout the game with some full court pressure and some transition. And I think those three guys can handle it. But that's that's what we really need to watch in this game is how does Jefferson apply the pressure? How does Mitchell with uh, those three guys handle that pressure? Right. Should be, yeah. Tim Reck will, will tell you that his team is certainly not the team that they were no. earlier in the year. Even when we uh, covered them at the, the President's Bowl, um, th this is a team that feels not quite like an eight seed. You know, they are much the better. eight seed, but they feel much better than that. So that one should be a pretty close game. Um, number four and number five, or excuse me, number four, number five, Roosevelt against Washington. Uh, these two teams, of course, very familiar with each other. They're very streaky. You know, both teams have gone on different winning streaks uh, at points in the season. This will be the third time that they're playing. The first time was back in the President's Bowl Classic, like we talked about. Yeah. Uh, Roosevelt started off slow. I believe really was, was, slow. That, was that the game the where they quarter. didn't score in the first yeah. quarter. Uh, but then the second time, Washington won a close one, 56-52. to 52. So it'll be a good game. We know that because after in that game where they were scoreless, in that first quarter, uh, they ended up they, – they won the rest of the game. They lost, obviously, by less than they lost by yeah. in the first quarter. So they won the rest of the game. But you got to imagine, if they make just a couple of shots in that first quarter, who knows how that yeah. game could have shaken out. So it'll be a close one no, nonetheless. A couple of, of notes. You're right. Mitch Begeman, Roosevelt's head coach, said, we might have played our best game against Washington, but we just didn't score in that first quarter. And then they think he said that Washington probably played one of their best games the second time that they faced off against each other. So, uh, yeah, how will this one go? We don't know. But Roosevelt is definitely a different team. Grand Coal, their leading scorer is not playing anymore. Um, Jackson Brower not on the team anymore. So they're a very different team than they were, you know, when they played back in December. However, 
They are always in the game because of the way they play defense. And Hayden Goff and Ishmael and those guards can hound the ball. So they'll definitely be in it. Washington has been a really streaky team. You don't know what you're going to get from them. They've been on seven-game winning streaks and you know lost three out of four in the middle of the season and then come back and won five again. So they're a team that feels like they're always in it as well. So going to be a great matchup. Um, both teams have really improved throughout the year, and uh, kudos to both these teams. I really think both these teams have overachieved this season. Yeah, you know they say though, JD, tough to beat a team three times uh, in the same season. It is. So maybe the edge to Roosevelt in this one. We will see. We'll see. Then on the other side of the bracket, number two Harrisburg versus number seven Watertown. The Tigers haven't won a state title since 1960. It's a long time, but this could be the year. They are the number two seed in this in this double A classification. Harrisburg's also won a nine game winning streak that includes a win over Watertown, 53 to 37, might I add. So pretty hand, well, hand taking care of business pretty handily. Uh, but the Arrows, they'll get another shot at them on Thursday. How, how does how do you see this one shaking? It's out? interesting for Scott Langrock, the head coach for Harrisburg. He said, you know, these teams we've been playing just in the last couple weeks. We could see all three of them if this tournament shakes out the way we think it might. So will that be good or bad? Who knows? But they definitely have familiarity with these teams. Um, Watertown's just one of those teams, though, that are tough to match up with. A lot of really good guard play, a lot of competitors, a lot of multi-sport athletes who are just tough. Uh, they have a terrific backcourt. Dylan Rowden has have a, had a great year for them. But I, I don't think there's a team that has fewer weaknesses than Harrisburg. They've got the inside play with, with Cam Phipps. They got the outside play with Van Bakken. They got the the college player with Merriman on the outside too. So it's gonna be it's gonna be really tough to beat a team like Harrisburg. They're built for for tournaments like this. I think they're gonna be on a on a run here. Yeah, and I think just when you consider how they took care of business last time, I don't see this one being much different. Like you said, Harrison really built for the tournament. They're a real balanced team, um, and I would expect them uh, to be ready to play at a high level um, during this tournament run. Then to round things out. Brandon Valley and Huron, uh, they actually played just a couple of weeks ago, and Brandon Valley won 64-43. So again, another comfortable win there against teams that played each other, or excuse me, between teams that played each other not too long ago. The Lynx have one of the best uh, post players in the class with Josh Altoff. They have gotten co contributions from other players as well, and Huron is young, but they have the best, the the, the number one scorer in this classification in the state with uh, Blake Elwine. So it, it's kind of you know. Different styles. In one team wants to play inside out. The other wants to. Well, I mean, really, every team wants to play inside yeah. out. But it's more. <clears throat> it's more obvious for for Brandon Valley. Huron gets that guard play from Elwine. Uh, this is kind of a clashing of styles. It, the, and they just played, and Brandon Valley did handle that game. But I think this game really could go either way because. Uh, but Brandon Valley, on the other hand, they've been one of the best teams since that calendar turned over to 2024. Uh, they really only had two losses, and that was a close one where if they hit that last shot, they beat Harrisburg. And another close one to Mitchell that got away from him in the fourth quarter. Uh, a combined seven points to those top two teams. So Brandon Valley definitely belongs in the conversation with Harrisburg and Mitchell as, as really elite title contenders in this game. Uh, for here on the message from Tim Buddenhagen is champions don't show up to get what they want they show up to give everything that they have and and you got to love that when there's a young team and a veteran coach like Budden Hagen he knows how to guide these guys and he's going to give them a lot of wisdom through this tournament they're going to come in with their hair on fire and they're going to play like they got nothing to lose because they don't so that makes Huron a tough matchup for anybody but Brandon Valley has been one of the best teams over the last two months. That's one of the greatest quotes I've ever heard. Yeah, I love that. I, I, I've never heard that before. I might need to steal that Champions one, Champions don't show up to get everything they want. They, give, they show up to give everything they have. Love you. Good coach, yeah, Tim Boudin. That is, that is some really good stuff. Let's make some predictions because All right. I, I feel like I want to play after that. Okay. So, number one and number eight, Sioux Falls Jefferson. Going to ride with Mitchell for as good as uh, Sioux Falls Jefferson has been as of late. I do think that Mitchell, uh, they've just been really good all season, and I don't see their season ending uh, in the first round. Uh, and, and, you know, hats off to Jefferson for the way that they've kind of, you know, they started off a little slow, but they've turned their season around. But I think it comes up, uh, comes to an end uh, in the first round against Mitchell. Then Ro Roosevelt and Washington, we talk about it's tough for uh, one team to beat a team three times. And for as much as I love Washington and as much as I love the uh, – the, the little chain, the chain, the chain uh, game, game changer yeah. uh, award that they give out after games. 
I don't know if they'll be giving one out after this one. It is tough to beat a team three times in the same season, and I'm going to ride with Roosevelt. For all the adversity, for you know missing two of their top guys, I think maybe they've got a little bit of an edge. They'll play with a little bit more of an edge, and they'll be playing, trying to avoid being swept uh, by the same team. So no one wants to lose three times in the same, team, in the same season to a team as well. So we're going to ride with the Riders. Then on the other side, uh, Harrisburg and Watertown. Like you said, Harrisburg's built for the postseason. I think they'll prove it. They're 18 and three. Again, we talked. I, I mentioned that uh, this section's one of the few that, or one of the only ones that has just one 20 win uh, team. And Harrisburg wasn't far off. They finished the season 18 and three, and I think that they advanced past Watertown. They took care of them early in the season. I think they do it again on Thursday. And then Brandon Valley and Huron. Going to pick the upset here. I think Huron, like you said, they're, they're, they've got nothing to lose. And after hearing that quote, you can't, you can't <laughs> drop a bar like that and then not win. For as good as Brandon Valley is, no disrespect to Brandon Valley, but you cannot drop a bar like that and then go out in the first round. So I'm going to ride with Huron in that one. Then we go back up to the top. Mitchell against Roosevelt. Sorry, Rough Riders, but I think Mitchell's just got a little too much for uh, Roosevelt in that one. I think they advanced to the championship rather easily, might I add. And then Harrisburg against Huron. I'm going to ride with Huron because that quote okay. is really inspiring. Wow, look at this guy. I'm really moved by that quote. I don't think you understand. Coach, if you're watching, <laughs> you've got a fan because that is some, is some really dope stuff. And also, I mean, just having the top scorer, like you said, I, I think guards Sophomores and the freshmen, they've, they've yes. got some really talented young players. They're not going to be – they're not going to be not favorites – Going forward, right? right. Here's, they get to play that underdog role, and they've got talent. Right, and this is kind of their, their first chance to try and put it all together in the postseason and see just how far they can get. And I think, like you said, playing with house money, I think they can shock some people, and I'm going to pick Huron. I don't wow. feel good about it at all. Um, I actually I really like Harrisburg. I think they're a really good team. But I, I'm just going to ride the, the quote wave right now. Uh, plus, I haven't been any good at this in any of the other sections. <laughs> so maybe if I go against my gut, I'll do a little bit better. But then we get to the championship. Mitchell against Huron. And I think Mitchell takes care of business and the Colonels win this section. I know it's a little chalky to, to pick the one seed. but Well, not chalky to pick the one seed, but uh, it's maybe a little bit easy to pick the one seed. But I think Mitchell's just been that good this year. They're only 20-1. There hasn't been many teams that have challenged them. A lot of people have been questioning just how good they are. But I think they are as good as their record They're says good. they are. Uh, and in a class uh, two-way section, that feels like anyone could win it. I feel like maybe leaning on uh, the, t the best team with the best record can't be too bad. And like you said, Huron a little bit young, maybe not ready yet if they were to get to the championship. So we're going to ride with Mitchell. Okay. Hey, it could happen, folks. But here's what I think is going to happen. <laughs> I think you're going to have Mitchell take down Jefferson. I, although Jefferson really left a bad taste in their mouth the last time they played Mitchell. They, they just didn't show up, but they have been, like I said, 6-0 and since then. Look for a close game there. Roosevelt, Washington. I do think Washington gets the third win in three games against Roosevelt. Um, it's it's just a uh, it's been hard climb uphill for Roosevelt to battle some of those injuries and some of those losses on the team. Harrisburg takes on Watertown. Watertown's no joke, folks. They they can hang with with Harrisburg in this one. I don't think they will though. I think Harrisburg, like I said, built for the tournament. Brandon Valley Huron. I love Tim Buddenhagen. I love the way he's going to get this team fired up. But I also love the way Craig Nelson gets Brandon Valley ready for games. And they have been so tough to beat since the early season when they started out, what, I think they started 2-3 and three or something and really have only lost to those top teams since then. So give me Brandon Valley. Uh, on Friday night, Mitchell taking on Washington. I think Mitchell will get it done. They played an excellent game in the regular season, went down to that final minute, and Mitchell won on the road. So I'm going to take Mitchell this time on a neutral court. Harrisburg against Brandon Valley. This is where the road ends for the Lynx. I, I really like Harrisburg in this one. And they've played that a really close game in the regular season as well. It came down to a last-second shot. That could happen again in this one. But give me Harrisburg. So, yeah, I got 1-2 in the finals. Whatever. You know what? I think these are the two <laughs> best teams. But who was the one loss Mitchell had this year? It was to Harrisburg. And they lost on their home court. I love Harrisburg in this situation. I think Braden Van Bakken has a tremendous tournament. Um, I love what Jacoby Merriman brings to this team. I love what Phipps brings on the inside. They got so many other dudes who can play on this team. I love Harrisburg. Give me them. I took them at the beginning of the year to be the number one team in the state. I'm taking them now to win it all. Yeah. Let me just let set, let the let it be known for the record. <laughs> if not for that quote, I probably would have had Harrisburg winning. 
as well. But I was just so moved by that <laughs> quote that I, I couldn't not at least get here, here on to the championship. Hey, FYI, read the blog. Go to midcoastsports.com slash blog, and there are coaches' quotes up and down that page. So you get yourself all worked up for that one. There's more where that came from. Yeah, there's a lot of coaches dropping bars in South Dakota. But uh, that is our outlook on the boys' state tournament. Uh, it's been a wild ride. It's been a fun season. But just to think that come Saturday, it's all over. For a lot of those seniors, this will be, this will be it. These three games in three days, best of luck to you all out there. Yeah, it'll be surely fun. Again, you can check out all the action in Aberdeen. You can check it out in Rapid City, or you can check it out right here in Sioux Falls. Like I always say, go and check out all these kids because there's a lot of great competition, a lot of great players in South Dakota, and who wouldn't want to miss right. uh, some of the best basketball during the best time of the year. That'll do it for this edition of What's the Hoops with myself, Darren Wallace, and my good buddy, Jandy, Jason, and Dara. We will catch you for the. Will we have one more show? I, I haven't decided yet. We might do a player of the year show next week. We might not. All right. We might do an award <laughs> show. We might not. I'm hoping we do because I'll miss you all okay. watching at home. But that'll do it one for this week. edition. We'll see you for one more next week on What's the Hoops. Check out the state tournament action. We'll see you guys next week.